Welcome to this roundup. As cyberspace creates new ways for interaction and integrates to aquaspace, geospace, and space, it is creating complex challenges for the old concepts of sovereignty, stability, and security. Moreover, the democratization of information access to knowledge and to one another across nation's geographical boundaries further creates new vulnerabilities. So since cyberspace has become an integral component to our lives, it is, having, it is heavily getting involved in politics as well. While until recently, its political impact was largely ignored. Events over the years have begun to recognize its effect on the very core of politics and is becoming a cause of great concerns for national security, even to our core institutions and critical decision processes. Moreover, the anonymity of cyberspace is already challenging political leverage and influence, national security and diplomacy, and borders and boundaries, thereby fundamentally shifting the foundations of international relations. Now, since all political and warfare conflicts have a cyber dimension, to discuss cyber politics further, I'm delighted to welcome Professor Brandon Valeriano to this round up. Professor Valeriano is the brand chair of military innovation at Marine Corps University and is based in the United States. Welcome, Professor Valeriano. We are so very Hello. honored to have you on this round up. No, oh, happy to be here. Happy to talk. Wonderful, Professor Valeriano. So we know that cyberspace is the only domain which is entirely human made. And it seems to have been created, maintained, owned, and operated both by public as well as private stakeholders across nations. Now, each of the layer of cyberspace, there are about 13, 14 layers currently, each of the layer uh, it has a different you know, technology and different you know, uh, processes involved and different uh, way it is being you know, implemented all across nations. So it is continuously changing in response to each new layer of technology, technology transformation, and it is not being subject to any geographical boundaries. Now, since the information and electronic payloads that we see are deployed instantaneously between any point of origin, point A to point B, the destination could be anywhere in the world, and connected through the electromagnetic spectrum, data, and information travel in the form of multiple digitalized fragments that are you know, blind. We have no control. There are no security controls. We cannot see what's coming our way. And it's undeniable routings, uh, unpredictable routings that we see that go through you know between point a to point b it's uh, you know it creates so many vulnerability points so at so many vulnerability points are there and there are so many points where politics can get involved so how do you see these you know many different points at which politics can get involved because you know it goes the whole cyberspace layers go through so many different nations and the way communication is happening not just about communicating emails but you know about how everything is being done it involves so many different countries you know and the so many different layers of the uh, cyberspace so how where is you know how many places do you see politics getting involved here well, this is the problem. It's everywhere. In a traditional concept of security, you have this idea of, say, blue space, red space, and green space. And blue space would be what you can do in your territory. Green space would be allies. And red space would be the enemy. But in cyberspace, everything is an attack layer. Everything is a potential vulnerability point. And you can't really be concerned with just operating in adversary networks you actually even have to operate in your own domestic networks to protect yourself because the adversary may be there and they may be in the public space or the private space. So really controlling where things are, who's in control, that's a real tough question. We get into a lot of federal questions in America. You know, the whole federalism issue, states, uh, domestic, local governance, and then you have private and um you know, various companies have different de demands and desires. So it's an immensely complicated space. And that's why traditional theories and traditional ways of thinking about security don't really make a lot of sense anymore, given the dispersed networks and the different variations of sovereignty that are going on now in cyberspace. You're absolutely right. The whole fundamental concept of security 
the definition and the nature of security has evolved itself because of the cyberspace. And as you said, that, you know, all these different zones, you, you know, uh, just talked about, you know, uh, ourselves, you know, our allies and, you know, our enemies. But like you said, you know, it's very difficult to know who the enemy is in cyberspace, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it is important. It's not that only uh, enemy countries are enemies. Even within our own country, we will have, you know, enemies. Like you said, you know, we will have adversaries, you know, uh, hiding in... Uh, the cyberspace has given anonymity to everyone. So it is impossible to know who the enemy is at the moment. And um, we cannot moreover, you know, the communication that is happening between, you know, point A to point B, it happens in a, such a way that, you know, the headers can be manipulated. So all the cyber attacks that are coming our way, while we would like to know, you know, who is, you know, attacking us, it is really difficult to know who the attackers are because, you know, anybody can manipulate the headers, you know, of the, any communication that is happening. And unless all the, you know, weapons like cyber weapons, when it enters our country, we have no way of knowing that cyber weapons are, you know, in our country, then, you know, in our city or, you know, in to our internet service providers to our computers until then we do not know that the weapons are coming our way and that's the way you know we have designed and you know developed the cyberspace so it is impossible to know who the enemies are how to know who the enemies are well this is the thing i don't really think there's an attribution problem and i think we can know who the enemy is because the enemy hasn't really changed the enemy is still the same we still have traditional rivalries traditional diplomatic politics what has changed though is responsibility and how you determine responsibility especially in a legal standpoint or even say from the russian standpoint that you know the russians attacked the 2016 american election but did putin order it is it a direct line of control or is it not maybe someone over here did something, ordered something to happen and the top didn't find out till later? That's tough to know in cyberspace given the nature of conflict. And also you have criminal enterprises and criminals will do things for their own motives. But also if you're a criminal in say maybe China or Russia or even America, you can be co-opted quite easily by the state. So it's not exactly clear who is doing what, given the diffuse nature of control in cyberspace. So for me, it's really a responsibility question, not so much an attribution question. Yeah, um, responsibility, you are right about that. I mean, this, this is a big responsibility question and accountability that we don't see in cyberspace. But yeah. at the same time, the democratization of innovation has mm -hmm. fundamentally changed everything because those were the days that any disruptive innovation we will be able to follow the money and we will know who is building what. If there somebody is trying to build weapons of mass destruction, we would be able to know because we'll be able to track the flow of the money and we will know who is developing what. But now, even with someone who has just, you know, a thousand dollars, they can buy a computer and, you know, anybody has a capability because the democratization of innovation, mm -hmm. the innovation could be both, you know, destructive as well as constructive. So we could have, you know, millions of, you know, destructive innovations that could be coming our way or, you know, the millions of, you know, people who would be trying to develop weapons that could, you know, harm anyone. It's not just about the United States, but anybody. So the mm -hmm any number of enemies, number of people who could be developing, you know, weapons that could uh, impact uh, not only cyberspace, but also geospace, aquaspace space mm -hmm. has increased enormously. So how do we know who is, you know, the enemy here? Well, to me, I think something you hit on there is really important. And this is what my, my real worry is now. It is um, in the future, especially in terms of space, we're going to have a lot of private citizens there. And I'm not so much concerned about, say, an American uh, satellite or a Chinese satellite getting hacked. What really is the problem is all these private actors in the space. And they aren't necessarily concerned with security the way a state may be. So their networks and their satellites can be compromised. So to me, it's more there's more opportunity for conflict. There's more opportunity for people to get involved. But there still is a traditional monopoly of violence by the state because it's tough to do these major actions like the Stuxnet attack, you know, likely probably required, you know, I'm not positive, but probably required U.S. and Israeli collaboration, plus probably a defector in Iran at the same time. So a lot of things had to go right for these operations to work. And you need a large bureaucracy for everything to kind of come together sometimes. But you can also have devastating attacks uh, and effects 
through just simple operations, just like um, you know something that happened to the city of Baltimore recently, where they were ransomware. So that is a problem. And the challenge is, how do we control this space? How do we maintain um, security in a space where there are so many different methods and places to attack? And this was confronted in America recently when they attacked the Sony Pictures Network over um, the movie The Interview. You know, and as Americans, we never really considered entertainment as a security threat in some ways, but it is now. It is. It is. You are absolutely right that cyberspace has fundamentally changed the whole, you know, warfare battleground. Like, and you don't know who is going to be attacked. It could be individuals or any entity across nations, its government, industries, organizations, and academia. And as I, you know, as we, you just mentioned, you know, that uh, the cyberspace. Uh, the space reality, the vulnerabilities emerging from space are a cause of great concern because cyberspace is now uh, connected to aquaspace, geospace and space. And especially when we see the space initiatives, a lot of you know people are getting involved in space initiatives. A lot of nano satellites are you know uh, going in space, you know, from private you know uh, individuals, and a lot of uh, that is for R and D uh, purposes. But at the same time, we are also on the cusp of you know having uh, asteroid mining, you know, space mining, you know, moon, mm -hmm. establishing moon colonies, and uh, it is not going to. It is not happening only by you know the government entities. A lot of private uh, corporations are involved, and the warfare that we have not been able to control in cyberspace it is definitely going to reach you know space and you know then you know uh, as you see now the digital order is moving toward digital disorder the digital mm -hmm. barriers have started you know emerging as you see china has uh, started you know creating walls you know and the mm -hmm. Reason behind that is they want to, they don't want the global information to enter their, you know, uh, country. So they don't want their citizen to have free access to free flow of information. Uh, and uh, that, you know, the digital, if, if we are moving toward digital disorder in, you know, here on earth, then that, that concern is that how are we going to protect the space? Are we going to create the boundaries in space that, you know, this is, uh, you know, United States, you know, space, this is China space. So the, we are moving towards very dangerous territory that is going to impact the future of the humanity. So how do we control that? Well, I mean, I think one thing is that there is a lot of positivity here because in some ways you might not want the state to control these things. In some ways, I mean, I think the Internet and technology should be used for education, social connection, business. And I think the instability there can be a positive thing in some ways. And China is going to try and control the Internet. Russia is trying to do the same thing. But it's really tough to maintain control, especially, as you say, from the potential proliferation of space-based Internet and other forms of communication that defy traditional boundaries and even fiber optic cables. So that's going to be a challenge for states moving forward. But we also have this thing called the stability and stability paradox. And we talked about this in the 60s in relation to nuclear weapons, but the basic premise is, is that there is some stability through instability, that chaos actually maintain security in some ways because if you can't control the networks if you can't monopolize information if it's if your networks are so diffused and dispersed like in america we have such a wide geographic space or even in ukraine you know you have such a wide geographic space it's tough for someone to attack one point and to destroy an entire network because there's just so much out there there's so many connection points so that instability and that sort of method of how we built the internet as not a place for security in some ways gives us openings for a future possibility of stability, if that makes sense in some ways. Well, that, I mean, can be positive, I think. Yes, I mean, sometimes instability is positive and, you know, this uh, freedom that them, uh, cyberspace is given to everyone the outer layers that you know anybody can create any application you know innovate that is increased you know it has exploded the innovation power which is really good we want everyone to get involved so those those changes that cyberspace has given us 
they are very very good democratization of innovation and do it yourself movement are really good for the future of the humanity because a lot of progress and development will happen science will progress you know you know very uh, rapidly not like you know before that uh, we will have one disruptive innovation and for an entire century the countries will keep fighting to you know have supremacy over that and then we will have another innovation we are you know witnessing disruptive innovations like you know ai and you know quantum computing and uh, synthetic biology and uh, so many different innovations are coming our way that are so disruptive and each one of them is you know fundamentally evolving and transforming the cyberspace and in return you know all these connected you know spaces you know across space geospace and space so now when the emerging technologies and when the threats posed by cyber warfare you know as if we talk just about the warfare are mm-hmm. not only just with the traditional tools but artificial intelligence and computer code and connected computers and information communication technologies and you know the other you know emerging technologies in cyberspace then it is very difficult to know or control or destroy enemy system because especially if you talk about ai mm-hmm. is going towards you know we are moving towards autonomous weapon systems so yeah. is not and they, 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 we will also you know soon have the ad- adaptive ai where we will not even be writing the code you know the ai will write the code mm-hmm. itself to you know improve itself so uh, is it fair to say that you know this uh, emerging technologies is overpowering warfare and you know removing the human factor you know very rapidly in this whole you know equation of warfare and peace in the coming years i mean i think the challenge is though is that these new technologies still depend on humans ai is dependent on the data we put into a system in the first place or there's a possibility that ai might make defenses a lot better and it might make america maybe say inert in cyberspace because our opposition may be able to have exquisite defense through ai but the problem with that thesis is that for that to work they need to have complete knowledge of what we're going to do and that's based on past operations so what's interesting about computer vectors of attack is there's a lot of free form there's a lot of development there's a lot of innovation there so it's really tough to predict and you know even a modern form of ai may not be able to protect you that much so there's a lot of interesting things that are going to happen in the future but it's a really important space to watch out for and i think um the main thing is that i don't think we have enough people involved in the space who are thinking in new and innovative ways too many people who do security in cyberspace really do it from a nuclear perspective where they bring their past biases in and i think the the main thing is to think about moving beyond your biases and to think in new innovative ways and that's really difficult yes you are absolutely right that we do need the new for, you know mode of thinking because the traditional uh, way of you know security or controls or warfare is not going to work because the recent change is brought by these technological drivers of warfare and the enemies that we face today as a nation not just united states but each nation you know that they enemies that they face they have erased the boundaries between what is traditionally regarded as war and it has blurred the boundaries between nations its government industries organizations and academia and even individuals military and civilian foreign and domestic nation and international and cyberspace and cosmos geospace and space so all the boundaries are blurred you know right now so the question is you know like you said that you know we are still focused you know on the traditional way of doing things so how how do you think nations should be reacting to this blurring boundaries as you know it in, because it definitely impacts war warfare preparedness because no military can protect all the entire country anymore because you know the like you said the resources is the main concern you know we just don't have the resources and we don't have the systems and platforms and models that would you know, integrate all these you know uh, different components of a nation or different spaces that we see And and this is a real big challenge for states and militaries because a lot of militaries offer order authority and alliance of control and deference and things like that but a hacker a person who's really good in this area they grew up as someone who broke things who someone who doesn't like authority so harnessing that power in an authoritarian military type of structure is very difficult so in the future we need to think a bit differently about who we recruit 
Who is valuable for national security? How do we include them? Can we include, say, wounded warriors now who can't do physical kind of push-ups and you know do the running requirements? These are things we need to start to think of, and it's really tough for a military to break that bias. So my friend Jackie Schneider wrote a really great piece of War on the Rocks that had the title Blue Hair in it. And it's basically this idea that the military needs to start to think about hiring people with blue hair. And you know, even in a lot of American militaries, even having facial hair is seen as a horrible, disgusting thing. And you know, we really need to change who we are because who is going to be important in security is changing and evolving right before our, our eyes. Yes, it's very true because, I mean, think about it. The, the war is also happening on social media in right. the form of information mm -hmm. warfare, right? So mm -hmm. uh, how, how do you, you know, how can military control something like that? Because there's so much misinformation, disinformation. You will see fake news. You will see fake, you know, audio, fake video, you know. Yeah. It's going viral on the internet we and we just don't know what is you know uh, genuine and what is fake so the nature of warfare has changed profoundly and it is now possible to achieve the wartime policy objectives you know without even resorting to any kind of violence so the conflict that you know militaries are facing now you know is uh, totally understandable because it's not easy to give up on all those old you know methods and modes of uh, warfare and just say let's focus on this because mm -hmm. you have to be prepared on both sides you know you have to be prepared that someone can still attack you you know uh, mm -hmm. with the traditional uh, weapons and you know you are in addition uh, getting this you know increased war you know uh, surface where you know this information warfare is going on and uh, the, even synthetic biology you know now you know any brilliant computer scientist can, uh, you know, pick, uh, and there are so many genes available, you know, in gene banks everywhere, you know, the bio banks and gene, you know, tissue banks and gene banks, so much, you know, info, genomic data is available. So you pick some genomic data from genes from here and there, and then, you know, the rest of the code, a computer scientist can, you know, write it himself or herself and create an entirely new pathogen, you know, that could come our way. Uh, so that those are the kind of you know security risks we are facing, and we no nation is prepared. It's not even about United States. No mm -hmm. nation could be prepared or is prepared at this point. So the all this when we see all these political and military conflicts uh, are now having a cyber dimension, you know, whose size and impact is very difficult to predict. How are you know nations, decision makers, politicians, governance models, you know, or militaries? How are they preparing for this? Well, that's the problem. They're not. And, you know, a lot of people aren't even thinking about decision making and how normal processes of crisis escalation are not working in the same way anymore. So we're not doing enough research on that. We're not doing enough research on the population and public opinion about how decision makers operate. And uh, the most interesting thing to me is about how people respond to fear in cyberspace about how you know this idea of say digital connectivity has become an assumption of a right in say a first world nation that they kind of depend on the internet to live to communicate to watch the media and that if you violate that what happens to the individual's mind and is this some sort of sacred core violation these are questions we haven't even really begun to answer in the right way yet. And we're kind of afraid to answer them because we're not sure what the answer is going to be and what the solution is going to be. And it's really going to be a challenge to how we operate going forward. Yes, that is very true. These are all very, you know, difficult questions and we have to start discussing them because we do need to come up with, you know, effective solutions. Because, for example, if you see now, you know, we are not only talking about saving all of our data, digital data in the cloud. Mm -hmm. We are talking about, you know, saving our data in a DNA. Now, the DNA data yeah. storage is emerging. And at the same time, DNA reading technologies are emerging. And from what it seems that in the coming years, in very near future, we will all, we are going towards miniaturization now. So mm -hmm. we are not even looking at, you know, all these uh, things that we can see. This, you know, we, we are going towards molecular chips. We are going, And in very near future, we could even have molecular bombs. It will it is not you know visible to our eye. So how are we going to protect ourselves? Because we just don't know the intelligence. We don't have the intelligence coming our way that who is working on you know molecular uh, technologies, who is working on developing molecular bombs or molecular weapons. Yeah, I mean there are no answers for this right now, and 
these areas of research are critical to national security. And I'm not so sure we've become aware of that just enough right now. And that's going to be, take a fundamental change in society. And of course, as you know, changing society is not an easy thing unless something dramatic happens. And say America and the way we changed society after the 9-11 attacks demanded an immense response. But getting, getting there without this tragedy is a problem. How do we evolve without being forced to do it? You know, this sort of, it's a question of natural evolution versus say punctuated equilibrium of evolution. And is there an event going to force us to move in a certain way? Or are we naturally going to evolve in a certain situation? And right now we're evolving not the most efficient manner. And that's a challenge. It's a challenge for government. It's a challenge for education. It's a challenge for everyone. Yes, very true. It is a challenge. And I mean, as far as when you talk about events, I mean, we hear all these events from across nations and especially in our embassies that, you know, all of a sudden some weird kind of uh, uh, symptoms were observed, you know, uh, and uh, we nobody knows, you know, what happened to all those diplomats, you know, and why they experienced those kind of migraines or some kind of, you know, neurological, you know, impact. And uh, that would make us think that all these emerging technologies, mind control technologies are also emerging. Mm -hmm. and we have no way of knowing, you know, what kind, how, who, who can develop, or who has developed those technologies or what technologies are developed that would influence our brain waves. And, you know, it would fundamentally change our thought process or it would control us or our actions. So those are also, there's a lot of fear. If you look at the you know, internet, you do search, there's so much fear about mind control technologies. Mm -hmm. And that would bring us a question, are they actually, you know, have we reached a stage where these technologies truly exist? And if they exist, then do how would we control that? And nobody has any answer to that. that do, do these technologies exist to control, you know, mind? Uh, I don't know. I don't really go into that uh, that area, and um, I don't even watch entertainment in that space because I uh, it, it reminds me too much of work. So I yeah. kind of try to stay out of that. These are very scary. Yeah, my own mind. <laughs> oh, you are right. I mean, these are very scary, but there is a lot of fear, and yeah. I hope that you know we are if you know those changes are happening that we are able to control that in the coming years because mm -hmm. those are you know really terrifying you know even thought that you know these kind of technologies could exist that could make any humans do you know whatever they want to do uh, they want the enemies want us to do so mm -hmm. it's a very scary thought but it's coming back to cyberspace you know it seems that cyberspace is also fundamentally uh, shifting the politics it is impacting the not only politics but also the politicians and mm -hmm impacting the governance models so how how does this uh, do you think that politics is uh, uh, shaping the digital disorder or digital disorder shaping politics do you think that politics is uh, shaping the governance models or governance uh, uh, you know models are shaping because the new technologies are emerging and coming our way mm -hmm. well i think new technologies are going to shape politics and the challenge is there's going to be resistance because politics is based on past processes and fundamental folk ways of how people have done things in the past. And that's no longer the case, that things are changing dramatically. And, um, you know, we have a problem where we have politicians who don't actually fundamentally understand the technology that they're trying to regulate. So that's going to be a challenge moving forward. And our education systems, as they are right now, are inadequate because we don't have enough people qualified to even teach on these areas. Yeah. So how do we get to a place where people understand even the basics? That's the thing I'm concerned about most. Right. How do we develop a workforce? How do we develop fundamental ways of communicating about these discourses? Because too many people are charlatans in this area. Too many people have these perspectives that don't really make a lot of sense or just say basic things that anyone can compare it. And having people with real knowledge, like in a, you know, like a field like physics or chemistry, we're devoid of that in cybersecurity. And we haven't thought enough about innovation. We haven't thought enough about change. And when we do, it's very superficial. Yes, very true. It, uh, those are serious concerns because our, all of our systems needs to be prepared for the rapid changes that are coming our way. And I mean, if you look, uh, Education systems historically has been very slow, you know, the, the, especially if you look at the 
institutions that they you know how the curriculum changes you know it takes a significant amount of time because there is a process that they follow but uh, thankfully you know we are seeing a lot of online you know uh, institutions or sites coming emerging that are you know taking uh, filling those gaps like khan academy and you know other you know in, in websites that are emerging or portals or platforms that are you know doing a lot of work in uh, uh, creating the education or providing education that is necessary and for example you know as far as uh, awareness about security risk you know we are also doing a lot of work in that area we are creating education awareness initiative and providing free education to everyone you know through our risk roundup discussions and our risk publishing so there are a lot of initiatives emerging but the as far as you know the cyberspace goes and politics goes mm-hmm. we are witnessing that you know the cyber attacks and cyber crimes and uh, all these different uh, malwares and everything that emerges that there is also a tool to change the you know political opinion or public opinion mm-hmm. and bring you know the political parties on the table to for a discussion so it is sometimes used as a tool to shape the opinion so and no, we are also witnessing that political parties especially if you talk in united states political parties are also uh, being hit by cyber attacks so do you think that politics and cyber security are colliding that you know uh, how the political parties uh, shape their you know political agenda that uh, the attacks that are happening are towards that yeah and that's been a fundamental challenge and it's interesting though because we don't really know enough about how you change someone's mind we're not very good at understanding the impact of even say advertising um and i think what we're finding more and more and there was a recent um pnas paper about the 2016 attacks by russia on america and what they basically were finding is the people who were interacting with the russia twitter bots were people who were already receptive to the message so i think it's really kind of reinforcing a message that people want to hear but as in terms of changing people's minds that's not so easy i mean i'll get a message on my phone and if i like baby yoda maybe i'll buy a baby yoda thing and that's because i want to i i'm looking for that but unless you're looking unless you're open to a message you're not going to receive it very well so i think we need a lot more studies about the brain and manipulation and disinformation and um a lot of people just assume an effect and for me the question is what type of effect how does it work who's receptive to it and i think that's the challenge that we have to research more yes absolutely there is a need for a lot of you know research in all these areas and especially if you see uh, we were hoping that these information communication technologies would bridge the divide and you know it would unite everyone and not only within a nation but across nations and you know the human species you know humanity will come together to solve the bigger problems facing the humanity the future of the humanity mm-hmm. but instead what we are seeing is that it's creating a bigger divide if you look at you know even in united states the political ideology that mm-hmm. it, it the divide between both sides is becoming more and more intense so you are right that you know we were hoping that technology will help us you know bridge the divide uh, but instead you know it looks like you know it's creating further divide and you know it is giving bigger platform for uh, you know people to create that divide you know by spreading misinformation disinformation so we will have to study and figure out how to you know bridge the divide so we mm-hmm. can uh, all you know come together unite as a nation to solve the problems facing our nation and if we talk about you know our collective civilization human civilization then we all nations need to come together to solve the problems facing the future of the humanity so that we can be prepared for what is coming our way you know no matter what happens in the coming years or you know decades or centuries so we are prepared and we solve all the problems but having said that what would you uh, where do you think we need to focus from your you know uh, mm-hmm. assessment I think it's some of the things I mentioned before. We need to focus on how we change people's minds, the effectiveness of these types of operations, how we can communicate to the human you know to the basic human level about the need to have personal security, to be responsible for your own um choices. Because the challenge is with cybersecurity, everyone becomes a vulnerable point within the state. and anyone can bring down 
any basic person can bring down an entire corporation, an entire state. They can be the fundamental vulnerable point. And I think we haven't woken up to that issue enough. We haven't woken up to how we are each responsible for security of our community, our state, everything now. And all these things are attack surfaces. And we want to minimize these attack surfaces and think more about security, but it's tough when everything is insecure. Yes, very true. Everything is insecure and everyone is responsible for, uh, you know, not only their security, their, you know, computer security or their network security, but also, you know, collective security because everything is integrated. And that is where the challenge is now that, you know, because the, even the very seasoned, you know, security professionals, they are also not able to control the security vulnerabilities coming their way or security attacks, uh, cyber attacks coming their way. So for a common man, common city, you know, city, all the citizens across, you know, the nations who has no understanding about, you know, c- computers and, you know, uh, getting the antiviruses or, you know, how, what to do, what not to do in cyberspace, which emails to open, which, you know, hyperlinks to click, which to not click, all that thing is not, you know, they are not well informed. So, yes, there is a huge, you know, uh, attack surface, you know, increasing because of the uh, lack of education and awareness mm-hmm. about, you know, what to do in cyberspace. So there is a hu- need for uh, definitely, you know, focusing on those initiatives so we can provide education and awareness. But having said that, what would you like to say to our global viewers and listeners about your books and initiatives that you're working on? Um. I, I think really what my research is really about is trying to push the boundaries of what security may mean and trying to push back against the common pathologies. And really, I think I just moved from fundamental question to fundamental question. So um, before I was concerned a bit about cyber strategy and how states were organized for coercion. Now we're focused on escalation because I think that's a big fear that cyber will be a pathway to warfare. And I think actually we're finding that cyber can be a pathway to warfare, but there's some positivity that there is some way, like say I wrote a piece for the Washington Post about the Iranian and US conflict recently, and how after the Iranians shot down one of our drones, we responded with cyber attacks. And that actually decreased the tensions because it's something you can do, but it's not too inflammatory to the opposition if they take it in such a way. So there are things that we can think about that might lead to off ramps to conflict. Um, Moving forward, though, I'm also thinking a lot about cyber repression and about how the state can use these weapons, not against other states, but against their own populations. And to me, that's a major fear, especially living in D.C. We have a lot of refugees here, a lot of foreign press that are attacked by their own state. And that's a common concern because a democracy depends on information. It depends on free civil societies to communicate. And I'm worried about the future of um, global democracy um, because I don't think the Internet's a liberation technology, as people suggested. I think it's a repressive technology. And we're seeing that in Hong Kong and other areas. And uh, that's where I think I want to push the research in the future to think more about that and how this can hopefully become a positive thing right now. But for now, it's become a very, very negative factor in all aspects of life. Yes, very true. And you are absolutely right that we do need to make sure that the cyberspace and the global free flow of information uh, remains, you know, democratized and free for everyone. And, you know, that no, we should uh, make sure that no nation is able to control or, you know, break that free flow of information because once they do that, then they start using the technology, cyberspace technologies and facial recognition technology and other technologies to control their population. That would be, you know, very dangerous path that nations would be moving towards, uh, especially, you know, for authoritarian nations. So, yes, you know, we have to make sure that these technologies and all the layers of cyberspace are used for progress and development for the future of the humanity and that everyone needs to benefit from that and no one should be repressed and you know we have to make sure that free flow of information everyone you know has access to it so thank you so much professor valeriano for participating in this roundup today we appreciate your thoughtful insight on the cyber politics and our global viewers and listeners will benefit tremendously from the information you provided on the politicization of cyberspace as well as the impact of cyberspace on politics based on the discussion we had today This risk round of dialogue has been of service, and we thank you for that. Happy to help. Happy to contribute.
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Professor Valeriano. So Risk Roundup, a global initiative launched by Risk Group, is a security risk reporting for risk emerging from existing and emerging technologies, technology convergence and transformation happening across cyberspace, aquaspace, geospace and space. We at Risk Group believe that risk management, security and peace, they walk together hand in hand. Though mm -hmm. security is related to management of threats and peace to the management of conflict, risk management is related to management of security vulnerabilities as well as management of conflict. And it is not possible to conceive any one of the three without the existence of the other two. All three concepts feed into each other. We believe that the security we build for ourselves is precarious and uncertain until it is secure for everyone across nations. Tradition becomes our security. So if you build a culture of managing risk effectively, it will lead us to security and security will lead us to peace. Let's manage the existing and emerging risk together. For more information on the Risk Roundups, to watch the Risk Roundup videos or hear the Risk Roundup podcast, please go to riskgroupllc.com and do not forget to subscribe and share. Until next time, I'm Jayshree, host of Risk Roundup, signing off. See you next time. Thank you.